So the work that I, I'm honored to be able to step into today in historic preservation is more formalized now. It's a, a tribal government department of you know, historic preservation and cultural affairs, but that it's formalized, but that um, this is work that, again, has been the effort to try to protect your ancestors' resting places and important cultural sites. That's always, you know, been going on, but now it's been formalized in the program that we have. Uh, just like many tribal nations, we have a, it's, we fall under these federal laws of the National Historic Preservation Act and the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA. And those are the two main laws that our program works under um, to be able to have the ability legal, you know, formal ability to be able to intervene on projects like um, pipelines and bridges, uh, road projects, you know, various construction projects across all of our territory, which today spans parts of six states. So we're busy uh, mainly, you know, with the site preservation work all throughout our homelands. And that's again why we have an office based here in Williamstown is to be able to be more on the ground and, you know, be out at a moment's notice when there's emergencies, you know, of um, ancestors that are being disturbed. Um, so that's why we uh, we have our representation out here primarily for site preservation and for repatriation work that I focus on, which is about repatriating ancestors from museums and, um, you know, universities or other places for reburial and uh, also to return cultural items that are significant to our community and our heritage. So beyond that, Beyond our historic preservation work, uh, our cultural affairs department also works on education about Mohican history and exhibits at museums. Um, our historic preservation, we work on state and national register listings. So I'm going to share some of those examples from focusing on Stockbridge today. Um, and our members take historical trips uh, whenever possible. You know, that's something that we in the past would always do annually. So I think that's the topic of um, next month's presentation if you're able to join. And our cultural affairs director has been very busy, especially the past year, with a lot of representation issues in our homelands and um, schools reaching out about native mascot issues and town seals, you know, being looked at again for how appropriateness um, and school curriculum, you know, local schools wanting to reach out to um, better include Mohican history uh, in their in their uh, curriculum. So we're, I just wanted to share that, you know, we continue to do this range of work. Um, with a very small staff. Um, and again, two of us are, are based in Williamstown, uh, myself and then a uh, archeologist I work with that works on the um, site preservation. So I uh, just wanted to, to share that, our kind of a range of work, and that's what I wanted to get into specifically, some examples of that that I think are interesting in Stockbridge. So uh, within, uh, within Stockbridge for repatriation that I focus on, uh, I'm highlighting a collage here of a few different uh, really special examples. So I'm going to start with in the upper left corner, you can see the um, town of Stockbridge facilities manager Chris Marsden is holding a document, I believe it's from around 1780, um, that's signed by 10 of our Mohican sachems. And because of his love of history, he was able to notice this document and he caught it before it was um, thrown out when he was going through the old town hall in Stockbridge and, you know, preserved it. And so this is something that we've requested from the Stockbridge Board of Selectmen if the tribe would be able to, um, to receive this document back. And so that's something that we're hoping, you know, will be considered this year and we might be successful in returning it. And the reason that's so important is, you know, I think since my time living out east here, which has been uh, six years now, you know, I guess I could see where people might take some of these documents for granted because they're they're everywhere here. You know, in, if you're in Stockbridge, um, it's just you can go to the town clerk's office and the documents stretch back to our tribe's you know time colonial era history there in the 1700s. And so you can see these documents so easily and maybe just think that that's that's common and how it is everywhere, but for us, we only have copies of documents. We get things, you know, duplicates made and or on microfilm, that kind of thing, but we don't have the original and it really makes a difference. You know, it's very moving and very emotional to hold those original documents in your hands or to see, you know, your direct ancestor's signature with our, you know, totem 
or you know marks on on the page and um you know just like that connection is very palpable and so um to be able to have this document back would be would represent the only document we have from the 18th century um besides the the mohican bibles that we have it'd be the only historical document that we would have in our um, collection at our tribal museum um, so it'd be very meaningful to us so, so we hope that we can re repatriate that this year is our goal um, and then i wanted to share that the both the wooden ladle um, that's pictured and then below um, bidwell house board member greg and blood and paul Lake and blood um, have been so generous uh, in repatriating two very important items to our community. Um, the picture on the bottom of, of Greg um, being honored with a Mohican Pendleton blanket by two of our tribal council members. This was from um, a couple of years ago, 2018, we had the uh, a history, Mohican history seminar in Stockbridge. And uh, the Gimblet family had um, found a Mohican wooden bow in behind the fireplace of their home from 1750s and it was placed in with the foundation of the house when it was built and so uh, they were really generous and inspirational to us in returning this it's it's really you know a source of pride to have the the bow back and so um, that's back at our tribal museum and then subsequently they've now offered um, the ladle that you see pictured um, it's made out of the ash burl into bird's head ladle or scoop and some of our tribal members have looked at the pictures of it and identified that it's more something that would be um, like a, a bowl, essentially, like an eating vessel that multiple people would have, you know, eaten from and shared and passed around. So the, the ladle is very personal, you know, family heirloom to have, and that's something special to be able to return. And so we're um, this week going to be picking that up from uh, the Gimblet, Gimblet family. So we're very uh, fortunate to to be able to receive those back and, and sincerely appreciate uh, the return of these items. So uh, in addition, I'm showing the picture is the Mission House. And we're um, working with the Mission House on a, a formal repatriation claim for three family heirlooms of our Sachem John Quinney. And those are, um, a couple of them are pictured below, his, his leather leggings and uh, a cane that pulls out into a sword, which is kind of incredible, um, as well as a pipe stem. And they're all his family heirlooms that the Mission House representatives had purchased in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, we're requesting those formally under the, the law that I mentioned, the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act or NAGPRA, to repatriate those as items of cultural patrimony because of his you know, stature as a leader in the community. So we're underway with returning those from the Mission House who, again, have been very generous and um, in kind to work with um, and, and they can they recognize how significant those items are to our community and to our heritage and how they belong back home essentially we have um, another Sachem Quitty's item that's shown in the picture the powder horn um, that we've returned and so Quinny's items his other three items from the mission house would be back home and rejoin you know more of his heirlooms that we're looking to bring all back together instead of being you know scattered at different institutions they would mean a lot to be in one place and be with us and be with his direct descendants. Um, so the Mission House has been very wonderful to work with and we're also uh, potentially discussing with um, the curator at the Mission House for other items that they have that they feel like, you know, just as thing, time has evolved, you know, kind of looking at um, which items would, again, kind of mean more to our community versus don't, aren't necessarily essential to telling the story um, of the Mission House. So. Those are just some examples of current, you know, under, repatriation projects underway um, in and around Stockbridge. Um, our Historic Preservation Office also works on the other major focus of site protection, so site pr and preservation. So it's just showing um, our other legendary leader, Sherry White, is in the upper left with the what you see as a ground penetrating radar equipment. Um, as part of a town project, Sherry, who's my predecessor in historic preservation, um, worked on surveying different bur potential burial sites around the town uh, to you know, look for below ground disturbances. So, and as part of that project, then uh, there were some burial sites that were discovered and research was done. 
um, and a headstone that you see below was, was placed um, to mark the resting place of two of our Mohican women ancestors and to um, you know, better protect th their resting ground. Um, in, this, in the top and the center, you probably recognize the top of Monument Mountain, which is uh, again, a sacred site of Mohican people. It's a place where our community members, every time we walked by, would place an offering, a stone offering, onto a pile with our prayers in it. And that original uh, stone feature was destroyed, um, but it's been recreated over the years. And whenever we return today, that's always a go-to destination of our community members is to go back and be able to walk on the, the same lands and place the stone offering and, um, and climb the mountain. So we've been working with the trustees of reservations organization for um, renaming of the peak uh, from Squaw Peak to Peak Scasso, which means virtuous woman, and on signage to better tell the Mohican history. So that's a really significant a way that we're involved in preserving important sites. Uh, we're also working on uh, updating the National and State Register, where a lot of this, you know, everyone knows about the really significant. Um, sites around Stockbridge uh, architecturally or for important people like Norman Rockwell and a lot of those sites or people are really uh, well represented in the record but Mohican original you know village sites and home sites are are less so um, and important people like Concapot that you see above in the um, town offices uh, and Umbuccini and so many other leaders are their stories just aren't included and their home sites aren't included so we're working on um, including the, their stories and biographies and, and locations in the National Register. Um, the Concapot Fountain in Lee uh, pictured below too is also something that Concapot descendants in our community came out a couple of years ago for the rededication. Um, but I wanted to share that, you know, the reason we've even been able to do that, the reason we've been able to, you know, for the example, especially of the National Register of even find these places again and you know, not just look at Stockbridge and say, oh, we have this vast history here and so many significant stories, but, you know, we don't, we don't know. Like I could just say my ancestor's not a Nikanuk, but, I, you know, where would I go to know where he lived? And the reason that we've been able to do that is largely because of the work of um, our local legend hero and what we, a uh, Bidwell House board member and um, to the tribe we call Nemots or our brother, Rick Wilcox. And because of Rick's efforts um, over so many years and going back all throughout his family, his grandmother was friends with my grandmother that I shared in the photos earlier. Um, Rick has been the you know, central figure in all of this work really and being able to help us find these places again. Um, he's the one who, as you know, showing in the picture there of the mapping, has physically gone out on his own and from researching deeds and measuring, you know, old measurements like rods to figure out where these sites are. So his work and the data that he's produced has been really central to everything that, you know, we've been able to do recently in um, historic preservation and bringing these sites back to life. So just wanted to, to share that as always and our profound appreciation for Rick's work. Um, also that the picture here is at the Indian Burying Ground Monument in Stockbridge with our Mohican veterans commander Bob Little um, and our just to share again that you know our stories of the tribe in Stockbridge have always been deeply intertwined and uh, you know Rick has been engaging in this work and, and personally clears the um, the brush at the Indian Burying Ground Monument himself and that's something that goes back to his ancestors had agreed to that when my direct ancestor, Donnie Kanuck and others, um, signed an agreement to with his ancestor to maintain the grounds, and that's something that he continues to do. So these kind of things aren't that long ago. It's something where this relationship between the tribe and the, the town has always been present. Um, some current archaeology projects we have going on. These are ones that we hope to conduct this spring, ideally. Um, these are projects that I think kind of interestingly bookend you know the different sides of our even though you know our history goes back many thousands of years but in the colonial 1700s time in Stockbridge these two events kind of are end to end so the 1739 meeting house site is the site of where um, the religious service you know church services of the Stockbridge Indian Mission 
and the political meetings um, were both held. And that was this one building that, you know, hasn't been concretely identified um, of where it is, which is what we hope to do in this project. Um, this meeting house site kind of tells the whole story of what Stockbridge or Indian Town was supposed to be. Um, there was supposed to be a town where the Mohican uh, would Mohican tribal members and the English four English families would co-govern, and the place that best represents that is the meeting house where these um, both the religious and political meetings were supposed to take place. So, uh, you know, so many of the petitions and different documents we work from were were written, you know, in this building, and you know, refer back to incidents that happened there. You know, being disenfranchised, and eventually our tribal members. You know, losing ground politically in the town and eventually, you know, being forced out, which is then represented in the, to me at least, is represented in the 1783 Oxrose site, which is, um, you know, our tribal members served in the Revolutionary War. And um, upon returning from that, if they return, um, George Washington himself uh, offered a a feast to honor Mohican veterans for service in the war. Um, and so this event, you know, called the Oxrose Feast was to, to thank our members for service. But then at the same time, within a few months of that event, um, we have a document that's right in the Stockbridge Library that shows um, tribal members were then forced to leave. So it's sort of a, you know, the meeting house is like, this is the vision, here's what was supposed to happen. And then the Ox Roast event to me is kind of, you know, thank you, for, you know, for everything, but be on your way. So, um, and it's also the the lands where the Ox Roast took place were the homeland or the home site of our Sage and Sol King Solomon and Uhana Nawat. So both of these sites are projects that um, are currently underway and we hope to be able to do this spring and um, bring more life to, um, to both of what of what happened there and at the Oxrow site, for example, that was described in the documentation as kind of being a legend of sorts, or it may or may not have happened. But through our work that we've been able to do, even just the doc documentary evidence, it really shows that it, it did happen. Um, and we're hoping through the archaeology to be able to ground truth it even further. So those are our two projects. I wanted to share um, some images from them. Um, the meeting house site is the again thanks to Rick's research we able to pinpoint it's by the chime tower on Main Street and so we have permission both of these occur on town land but the town is granted permission um, to do these projects as part of two different grants so the meeting house site is on town um, on the town land by the chime tower and we're hoping to do a ground penetrating radar and based on the results of that some shovel testing to identify that site and um, you know, again be able to better uh, by documenting it, better protect it and preserve it and interpret it. Um, the Ox Roast home site is along a bend in the Houstonic River near the Ice Glen. Here's an image of that. And uh, this was from the archaeology that took place. The first phase of the work was um, in 2019. Uh, we did a first phase of archaeology along the Ox Roast site, and our goal then is to continue based on um, the areas that were the most concentrated of, you know, potential uh, or further artifacts there, that we're going to um, do more in-depth excavation uh, this year. So this was some of our community members that came back um, on part of our walking tour. Uh, we were able to stop by the archaeology site as it was happening, which is really exciting and, and learn from what was going on. So other, another major project we wanted to highlight um, in Stockbridge is our Main Street walking tour. Um, and I just you know, wanted to share that the two sites I mentioned, the Ox Rose location and the uh, meeting house are but two sites out of 11 that we've developed into a walkable tour of Main Street. So our territory, again, you know, extends just in the Stockbridge area, extends much further than Main Street, but we've created a walkable tour, um, really thanks to Houstonic Heritage for being an early and very dedicated supporter of this project. Um, and again, with Rick's research of being able to pinpoint these locations, we've been able to 
keep going with that, you know, to pinpoint a location and then have, um, in this case, several of our community members came back and we were able to record um, narrations and, you know, their own interpretation in front of each site of what that site meant to them, what the history is at each site. So um, that's something that uh, we're really pleased to be able to share. So I hope you would write down the, um, the link to it, nativeamericantrail.org. And, and take the tour from home or go out in person and, and you know, follow the trail. Um, something you know, that I hope comes away from that is just um, how significant that is to give us these places to go to, you know, to not just have on, on paper, but to be able to go to and to really start to think about the relationship when, and make it very real. And I think that's part of what we're trying to combat is this erasure, you know, and I think when you come to Stockbridge today, there's not, anything very visible that represents our history, which is the whole reason for Stockbridge existing. So um, it's a start, you know, it's something that I hope that people will take it and start to think about really what it felt like, and especially how so many, you know, of Main Street in particular is laid out exactly how it was when our tribe was there, like the parcel boundaries are just drawn around where um, our ancestors lived. So you can kind of start to picture, you know, this is not an Econoc, oh, and this was, you know, you know, um, his father, King Ben, where did he live and what, you know, what would it be like to, um, you know, with, at that time. So um, I wanted to share then since I think we're okay on time, I wanted to quickly just share a, um, an excerpt from the introduction to the walking tour to give you a sense of what it's like. So Heather, can you let me know if this, if you can't hear this, but I'll give it a try. Sure. The lands of the Stockbridge have always been the beloved homelands of the Mohican people. However, our original territory extended much further from Lake Champlain and the entire Hudson River to Manhattan and to the west here in the Berkshires, along the Housatonic River extending to the Westfield River. Today's Stockbridge, by its current boundaries, was formed in the 1730s and first called Indian Town. The stated purpose of Indian Town was to be a Christianized settlement an experiment in assimilation and joint governance. This experiment lasted only 50 years before the tribe was systematically dispossessed of our lands and forced west. Today, against all odds, our people continue as a federally recognized Indian nation called the Stockbridge Muncie Community, now based on a reservation in Wisconsin. The reservation is about the same size as the original 23,000 acres of Indian Town. There are roughly 1,500 enrolled members. When you walk in Stockbridge today, the remarkable history and contributions of our Mohican ancestors are not visible. Our homes have not been preserved. There are no monuments to our warriors or our diplomats. As a small effort to honor our ancestors and combat Mohican erasure from Stockbridge, seven of our tribal members return to the homelands. They will be your guide on this Stockbridge Main Street walking tour and interpret 11 sites important to our cultural heritage. We hope that you gain an appreciation of Mohican Nation past and present as you walk in the footprints of our ancestors. Please visit Mohican.com for more information. Okay. All right. Um, so I wanted to have closed with our whole topic of finding places and, you know, I said honoring Mohican history, but, you know, if you're wondering why does that matter and like, why should we honor Mohican history? Um, I'm going to share my thoughts on that, that, oh, I think it very much does matter and that Mohican history is the history of Stockbridge and Berkshire County. Um, and some reasons I, you know, particularly think that is that, you know, it, for identity reasons for our community. I just wish I could convey, and there's no way to, you know, without experiencing it, that, um, you know, personally, I just feel like connecting in our homelands is a place, being able to walk out here and visit our sites, um, it helps you understand who you are. And if we didn't have this place to go back to, or, you know, these sites weren't 
um, identified and preserved. It would just be such a loss. Uh, we don't, right now when we come back, you know, you, you can directly speak to your ancestors on the grounds that they lived on. It's just a very direct, um, you know, connection to them. Um, I also think that for anyone out here that telling our story, you know, when it's something that for so long hasn't um, been told in a truthful manner, um, or, you know, has been very limited and kind of romanticized or um, made invisible that, you know, that's really powerful then to tell our story and to get to, um, to share that in schools or, you know, elsewhere that I feel like for anyone to just acknowledge what happened and, you know, the, the losses that took place, but um, just face it you know, truthfully that you know it really connects us from past to present and i feel like by it's really it's it's also i think a contemporary um relevance as well that i feel like by telling the truth about our history here that it's part of um in terms of racism it's part of dismantling one pillar of that which is miseducation about american history um so i think that this is really important work um, and in general, I feel like it enriches our you know, humanity. I just feel like you know, I hear all the time from um, our community members as well as from uh, you know, residents in our homelands that how much would be lost without the Mohican story and specifically in Stockbridge as well as you know, all throughout our Hudson and Housatonic River Valley homelands. But especially in Stockbridge, it's just so much at the surface you know, when you walk um, on Main Street and elsewhere, that it's so woven into the cultural heritage there and that relationship, um, the conversation between Mohican ancestors and residents today is, to me, is still very present. And like I shared in the example of um, Rick Wilcox's, uh, you know, personal family history at the burying ground and my direct ancestor there, you know, be part of the deeding of that, uh, those lands there, it's, it's not, you know, so far in the past. It's something that has very much, you know, contemporary relevance. So I just hope that we can, despite all the painful parts of all the losses and how, you know, the heartbreak, that it's something that we can continue to work towards getting to a better place. Just wanted to say Onewa, thank you. And um, and with sharing, this is um, from Williamstown, where our Historic Preservation Office is based now. I'm at 86 Spring Street, so right now I'm not, you know, able to have visitors, but please be in touch and take down my email. Um, other picture is also in Williamstown on our homelands. That's my son. Um, proud to be back. So we're very happy to be on our homelands um, and now to have a, an office space uh, very meaningfully in Williamstown of all places because the Williams family, uh, again, being connected back to Stockbridge and being the major uh, family that was the cause of um, you know, a lot of the thefts of our land in Stockbridge. So it's really significant to regain a place there. Um, also to follow us on Facebook, uh, Historic Preservation, like I mentioned, is part of our Cultural Affairs Department and our Tribal Museum, the RVD Miller Library Museum. So we put on a lot of um, events or put out other historical information on there. So I encourage you to follow us on there. So thank you for caring about um, our history with everything going on, especially this evening. Um, thank you for, for joining and for sharing our story with others. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thank you, Bonnie. And I should say too, um, the Arvid Miller Library does some great presentations. They actually had one yesterday that you could watch on their Facebook page for fa with Facebook Live, talking about archaeology local in the Campusa Bog. So um, yeah, it's definitely worth following them. Um, on Facebook and keeping up with the different events that they do. Um, and so um, I have a few que few questions that have come through, but if anybody else has questions, um, feel free to send them along. Um, one question was um, the Indian Town kind of seminar that you guys did a couple of years ago. Um, is there, are there any thoughts to do anything like that again um, to, you know, bring up uh, so many members of the tribe came out and it was such a great educational opportunity for people and as the story has been getting out more and more, I just wondered if there was any thoughts on doing anything like that. Yeah, uh, thank you. I would say that's um, after it happened right away, we were already starting to think about the next one. There are already you know calls to do another one, but um, mm -hmm. obviously right now everything's been you know called off and moving right. to virtual. <laughs> um, but I guess I would say that uh, you know for when that is safe to do again, that you know I would love to see that be something. Um, maybe annual tied in somehow with 
something that the town might want to do, you know, if there was an annual event or something that the town, you know, if we had some support, I guess, is, is part of it, you know, if that was, it's a lot to put on, and that was completely, you know, organized and funded, you know, 100% through our tribe and our own tribal contribution dollars, so um, I think if there was some annual event of the, the town that we could, you know, piggyback onto or something that might make it easier to, uh, to pull off, but yes, we'd love to do that, and there's always a strong desire to uh, come back and share our stories. And I think from that event, which by the way, is um, a lot of the, the sessions on it are on the CTSB, Community Television. Oh, okay, Berkshire, sure. Mm -hmm. Southern Berkshire. So, um, you know, if you wanted to look back at those, but I think one of the most powerful moments of that kind of unexpectedly maybe was um, the Words of Our Ancestors session where community members directly read back um, words of their direct ancestors um, writings that were mm -hmm. often from Stockbridge itself. Um, and so to read those, you know, back where in Stockbridge where they came from, where the words had, you know, been spoken, but maybe at the time that they were written or spoken were mm -hmm. not heard or not respected to bring those back to life. I think that was for everyone involved. I think that was a highlight and I, I could definitely see something like that, um, you know, continuing um, as well as now you know, taking everyone on the walking tour would be really special too. So yeah. we would love to. Once we can all be together help. in person. <laughs> yeah. um, so one question that came through is where on Monument Mountain is the traditional ritual of placing the stone that you mentioned? Oh, um, well, from what I understand, and I think we have Rick Wilcox perhaps as a, a plant he, in the audience too. He is on we, here somewhere. get something yes. wrong. So get, but I, from what I understand, um, the off the offering place was it is basically where it is now so the recreated location mm -hmm. from what i understand is as far as you know close to where the original one was so mm -hmm. if you're at the base of monument mountain and you take the um the trail to the left hand side um that it's i, mean, I think it's called indian monument trail but we're I think, renaming it to mohican monument trail mm -hmm. but it's um maybe i don't know i'd say 10 minutes or so walk up up that path and then there's signage there so you, mm -hmm. you know you should see it okay great um so yeah a few more questions have been coming in so um somebody actually said that they have a copy of a map from 1783 showing two indian burial grounds so she wanted to know if you would want to see a copy of that map and then also um the same woman Lori, asked why do some people spell it mahican m-a-h-i-c-a-n Yes, um, sure. I would love to see the map, Lori. Please send. I think we've been in touch. So um, yes, thank you. And then the Mahican and versus Mohican. I mean, none of them are, you know, are correct or more, really more right than the other. Like I shared, you know, our traditional name is the Mahikaniuk. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, from what I understand, uh, Mohican with an M O was mm -hmm. more of the English. Uh, you know, to English ears, more of the variation that they chose to to spell. We didn't have a written language, so all of these spellings are all going to, you know, be based on whoever wrote it. But um, and then Mahican with an A was more of the Dutch. Um, mm -hmm. Some people in our community today, you know, say Mahican is because it might be a little bit more similar to the you know Mahikaniuk sound. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Mo Mohican with M O, I mean, is what is in our our name, you know, officially. Um, it's kind of just stuck and that generally is what we go by. Right. Okay. And then to follow up on that, um, Diane asked um, if the Muncie um, in your name, in your community name, is a connection between the Stockbridge Mohicans and the Muncie Delaware tribe? Yes. Okay. So um, some Muncie people, some Muncie are very close related um, kin from southern Hudson River Valley on into um, Delaware, parts of Pennsylvania, you know, just mm -hmm. basically southern below Mohican territory. Mm -hmm. um, but Mohican ancestors from the Hudson Valley would go from Lake Champlain, you know, all the way down into Manhattan for mm -hmm. gathering coastal resources and things in Manhattan area. So we would always be interacting with Muncie people from the, mm -hmm. you know, lower Hudson River Valley. So we're very closely related. Sometimes people, both, we have both Muncie and Mohican um, languages officially in our tribe. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people describe them like dialects in terms of being so closely related. And from what I understand, mm -hmm. From the documentation you know they were mutually understandable at the time mm -hmm. um and so some muncie people therefore you know because of those close connections did come in with our community in stockbridge which is part of why we started often going by being referred to as the stockbridge indians because we weren't 
solely Mohican people after the time in Stockbridge. Um, Muncie people and other um, Algonquian-based people came in. Um, Muncie people also, like if you've heard of uh, Daniel Ninnam, for example, is a famous Wappinger or Muncie, like he is documented as being alongside Mohican leaders in Stockbridge, um, signing different documents and things, but he was Muncie, Delaware. So okay. Muncie people came in at that time, but continued to, mm -hmm. um, after we were forced to Indiana, Wisconsin, beyond, um, other months he ended up in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, there's two months communities there. Wow. Okay. Now that's great. A um, couple more questions. Someone um, asked, um, I think they're curious to know about life in Stockbridge. Um, originally, you know, was, were there farms together? The, were the Indians and the settlers living side by side? I think, um, how did they interact? Um, it's kind of a big question. So I don't know if it's something that's very easy to summarize, but, um, they're just kind of curious about yes. life in Stockbridge. Okay. Um, from what I understand, the I mean, it depends on, you know, the original idea was supposed to be um, all of the land in Stockbridge being communal, except for Reverend Sergeant and four English families were in, you know, one area and the rest. Of, so I guess in that respect, the no, I might, I don't believe that was side by side, at least at first. Um, with English families, they were more in a you know separate area, and the rest was communal for Mohicans. Um, but other than that, I mean, yes, there is very from the documentation you can see is very close interactions. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you know, with you know in the the meeting house was jointly you know the meetings were among both um, and uh, farming. You know, so yeah, we have there's all the examples of our community members. Um, farming in Stockbridge during this period in the English style ways, which was, you know, part of the reason for one of the factors for loss of land was, um, was adapting to that method of farming and those type of implements um, and having to purchase those and everything, you know, ad adapting to that way of life mm -hmm. uh, was also some, for some people, you know, the reason why they um, had, the, you know, loss of, of land from becoming in debt from, you know, from adapting to that. And then um, mm -hmm. at some point, once the lands became, um, being able to use as collateral for debt, then that was, you know, another one of the right. the reasons for why that happened. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, yeah, that's so, so many things like that, that, you know, <laughs> that just were just horrible at the time and just snowballed over the years. Yeah. Um, but most of our community members um, were, you know, learned English and could speak English. And mm -hmm. by that point, so I mean, yes, there were interactions. Right. Right. Um, so someone else has a question about um, Mohican people returning to live in Stockbridge in the Berkshires um, and wanting to know if that's something that, you know, people have talked about, if there's a desire, about, uh, what kind yeah, of, what kind of support they would need to do that. <laughs> um, millions of dollars to be able to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, everyone says that when, you know, I come out and visit, um, like for the Indian Town History Conference, you mentioned, I mean, it always comes up, like, could you imagine, you know, like, in a lot of the cases when you're standing on your direct ancestors land and are saying, you know, could you imagine if, you know, you were able to live here? But no, I mean, as far as I know, I, I don't know of any um, concrete examples of, um, like, homes more, you know, for people to actually return to and live in. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I should say a significant example, though, of a space that's created besides our um, office space at Williamstown, which is donated, um, you know, it's free of charge from the college that mm -hmm. uh, at the Mission House, there's a, the building next to the Mission House on Main Street in Stockbridge that um, is called the Carriage House now. Mm -hmm. um, that that building, we have an agreement worked out um, to be able to, uh, to use that, that building for, um, an exhibit space or you know for whatever we want so that's something that our cultural affairs department is currently working on to hopefully have open um by this summer if at all possible and safe to do so that we want to be able to have um you know our own you know the use of the space and i think that was for five years i believe was the agreement so we have you know it's a small but very important foothold to have um on main street and stockbridge be able to tell our story or um do mm -hmm. events or um you know, different workshops and things there. So as right. far as residential, somebody returning and, and living there, I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't know of that, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah, that's an example of having a space back. Yeah, sure. And then follow up to that, just talking about houses, someone asked what a traditional Mohican dwelling would have looked like. Um, I think I'm assuming they're asking before the settlers came in. 
Um, well, I guess I would, yeah, even during the time, the colonial time, there's both traditional and English style. So um, there, you know, there's, the, again, when I was saying how like the um, land boundary, parcel boundaries of individual homes today um, were drawn around people's uh, original home site. So when those were recorded, sometimes they're described as being a wigwam, you know, that it would be um, like a, you know, birch bark or whatever the local, you know, depending on whatever local materials are there, like um, bark material, uh, dome type wigwam, um, or an English style like frame house. So at the time of the founding of Indian Town, it was both side by side, um, you know, all along uh, Main Street and what's today's golf course area uh, was all you know, village side of those homes side by side. So our homes are a little different than if you've seen more like um, Haudenosaunee or Iroquoian like long houses that are like much longer have would have many more families living in one. Ours would maybe be you know a family or a couple of family, you know, but it wouldn't be like quite as the size of them. And the and the ones other times people are more familiar with here are that we have the longer and then like palisaded. Um, and ours weren't, um, you know, in any way like like that. They're just a dome shaped wigwam. Yeah. Um, and then someone else followed up with um, a question about land reparations. Is that anything that um, the tribe is working on? Yes. Thank you. Um, we don't have a formal, um, you know, plan for this or uh, guidelines. But as people have reached out, um, we do have. I'd, I think just only one example I can think of right now that comes to mind that uh, last year we signed a cultural use agreement with um, Soul Fire Farm in Grafton, New York, uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of in between Stockbridge and Albany or Troy area. Um, and uh, Soul Fire Farm granted us, um, I think, 60 some acres of their farm for our, con which, for our continuing reuse of the land into the future. So whenever tribal members, you know, come back to the area, we have this agreement in place for being able to gather on the land, you know, for ceremonial purposes or gathering, um, you know, foods, hunting, you know, different things on the landscape that they have. So uh, mm -hmm. we have a, you know, in terms of a signed agree cultural use agreement. Um, we're also, uh, I guess, just outright working on a, a land agreement with um, Open Space Institute, a land conservation organization. Um, mm -hmm for Papskini Island, which is an island in the Hudson River, um, just kind of south of Albany, and it's named after Mohican Sage and Papskini. Um, and we're, it's a National Register District, and we are, our tribal council is looking at, um, is in the process of agreement for taking over the use of that, um, it's a nature preserve. So yeah. we would continue to manage that, it would be open to the public, but it would be, you know, really significantly back in the tribes, um, Mm -hmm. possession again yeah yeah oh that's fantastic yeah um let's see a couple more here somebody asked what the correct spelling of the original name of the Mohican tribe is um oh original name well, yes the ori <laughs> I can share the name that um that I had used but like I said we didn't have a written language so there's not right, right. You know, one exact but um Mahikaniuk Okay, so M U the common spelling is the M U H H E A C O N N E O K. I can type that in. Yeah, if you want to put that in the chat. Um, yeah. And then, oh, somebody asked what the word for notable woman was that the peak will be renamed. What was that word again? Peak Scasso. Okay. Um, so we were we had a, a community vote for different names for that. Um, and the selected name was chosen partially because the name um, currently of Squaw Peak, um, Squaw has become, you know, derogatory, is mm -hmm. considered derogatory, but originally it wasn't. Um, right. It just basically means woman and in, it's kind of across several different Algonquian languages. So, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we, we recognize that in today, day and age, if you were to be called that, obviously, you know, it would be a slur. So it, we mm -hmm. thought it would be best to correct that. Yeah. Um, so the new name is that we've suggested is Peak Scasso, mm -hmm. um, which means virtuous woman. So it kind of mm -hmm. is related to, you know, the squaw, but then incorporating it into the 
you know, more true meaning of vir virtuous woman. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. And then one last question. Someone said they once heard that Mahikanek translated to moon over still waters. Um, do you, have you heard that translation before? I'm sorry. I, yeah, I, I don't personally know the answer to that, okay. but um, we could, if you would like to reach out, um, Richard, it looks like, if you wanted to reach out, um, I can connect you with our language manager who could probably guide you on that. Great. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Bonnie. This was a great talk. It's so great to hear about these archaeology projects. I, I hope I'll keep my fingers crossed that everything can start in the spring or summer. Um, but yeah, no, this is great. It's so great to hear what you, what you guys are working on and what you're doing. And, you know, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for amplifying our story and everyone for, for caring and hopefully um, share with others as well. So, Anishik, Oneiwa. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone.